Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for January 28th, 2019. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopp Heidi. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is securing cyber science. <sighs> Pardon, Securing Scientific Cyber Infrastructure, the Research Security Operations Center, or Research SOC. And it will be presented by uh, Vaughn Welch and the Research SOC leadership team. Let me uh, briefly introduce the team and go over some uh, further instructions. So first we have Vaughn Welch who will be speaking. He's the director of Indiana University Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research and director of the Research SOC. Then we'll have Susan Sons, who's the Chief Security Analyst at Indiana University Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. Uh, next will be J James Marsteller, the Chief Information Security Officer at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. And then we have Richard Beaver, uh, Chief Information Security Officer at Duke. Then we have, next we have uh, Ina Cooper, Assistant Director at Data to Insight Center at Indiana University. Uh, Michael Korn will be uh, speaking last, uh, the Chief Information Security Officer at the University of California, and then Susan will be bringing the presentation home. Uh, a couple more things to note before we begin. Uh, the presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. So uh, if you click on the chat icon and you um, type a question here. Um, and you can see I just typed in a little comment there. I will be following the chat during the presentation. And we also will, will be shooting for time at the end of the presentation for taking questions as well. And with that, I will hand over the presentation to Vaughn. Vaughn, welcome. Uh, thank you, Jeanette. How's my audio? Sounds good. Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us here this morning on the Trusted CI webinar to hear about this uh, sister project, as I like to call it, the, the research SOC. Uh, Jeanette has already introduced my co-presenters here, but here are their names again. And we're part of a, a larger team. Uh, this project is not only at Indiana University, but as you gleaned from my, my co-leads, also at Duke, uh, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, and the University of California, San Diego. And my role here this morning is to kick off this presentation with a fictional story about a science project to motivate why we're doing this work. And why it's fictional, um, I think it, it has some, some common elements uh, from reality that may resonate with some, uh, some of you. And the story starts with um, this fictional science project and its principal investigator, Maria. And Maria is reading about cybersecurity incidents and risks and thinking about how those risks could impact her science project. And so concerns that come to her mind are issues of data integrity and how cybersecurity incidents could in fact impact the, the integrity of the data that she's collecting. She's also concerned about the availability of her instruments and, sci and cybersecurity incidents uh, hitting at a bad time that could impact uh, science runs and the collection of, of results. And while you know, she doesn't really consider any the data that she has uh, confidential, you know, like a lot of science projects, it's open data, there are times when there are some embargoed periods before announcements or before data can be uh, quality assured and distributed to the community, which could cause some issues uh, if, it were, if it were leaked. And so there are some periods. And then finally, just a, a set of random attacks that could impact uh, her systems, which really don't have anything to do with the science. But unfortunately, as we've seen with some things like ransomware, they don't really care what your data is, just that it's valuable uh, to you and then hence hold it uh, ransom. 
So based on these concerns, Maria turns to John, her information technology lead, and asks him to pull together a, a cybersecurity risk management plan around all this and, and give it some, some thought. Uh, so John, you know, looks around on the uh, on the net and, uh, you know, pardon the, the plug for trusted CI, but finds some good guidance out there and, and manages to develop a, a, a cybersecurity program for this he's comfortable with. Uh, but notes there's still some technical services that he would like to instantiate. And in particular, you know, an intrusion detection service to know when, when something goes wrong. And so he turns to uh, the project's network engineer, Lucy, and asks Lucy to install a, a, an intrusion detection service for the project. So Lucy goes out on the net and does some research and finds there's a number of uh, open source IDS systems that, that looks good. She figures out what an appropriate computer would be and the appropriate hardware in terms of network taps and buys all this and, and installs it and uh, goes through the, the documentation on the network gear and figures out how to get the appropriate feeds in terms of flow and data uh, to the, the IDS system, gets this all set up. And then she, she turns all this IDS on and uh, it's kind of like, you know, lighting up uh, fireworks on, on the 4th of July. Alerts just, just pour out of this IDS system uh, based on this. So Lucy then learns how to, uh, how to configure and, and program the, the IDS um, such that, you know, she starts filtering out things which, you know, may, you know, seem odd to it, but are normal. They've got some SCADA traffic and for controlling the telescopes. They've got data downloads to all over the world. They've got users coming in from far-flung locations, and these are all normal project things. So she takes some while to, to teach the IDS system what's normal and what's not, and gets all this right, and does all this experimentation. So she's working to get all these false alarms uh, from the IDS system down. However, even the few that she's got left are still get old in the middle of the night since you know intrusion detection is a is a 24 uh, seven operation. So you know this 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 is a little bit more arduous uh, than if it was just sort of nine to five. So Lucy continues this, this process for a while, slowly working down the, the number of false positives. And then one day she, get an she gets an alert and she figures out it's a real incident. Uh, the main data server for the project seems to be mining a cryptocurrency and there's some telltale network signatures of that. Uh, so Lucy goes back and talks to John, and and so they start figuring. Okay, now now what do they do? They've actually successfully deployed the IDS, and it works. So they do some some very reasonable things. They take the data server offline so they can start uh, you know rebuilding it. And they realize they should let the the scientists and the project know what's going on. So they send out an email to their science community letting them know the server's unavailable, they'll get it back up, and they start working on, on fixing the, the system, all well-intentioned and good steps. Uh, meanwhile, back to our, our principal investigator, Maria, she's been on a plane during this, and she gets off the plane and has a phone call, and it picks it up, and it's a, it's a reporter from a science magazine hearing that their server's uh, been hacked, which he's learned from the emails going out. Uh, and this has caught Maria flat-footed, and so she has to, to get back to the project. So I'm going to leave off our, our story here. Um, maybe there's some parts of this which unfortunately sound familiar to some of you, but this is uh, what's motivating the, the work you're about to, hear, about to hear about. And I'm going to turn things over uh, to Susan Sons. Uh, next to, to take us through the, the next part of our presentation. Hi, everybody. So there are some special challenges when we're trying to do incident response for science because we're trying to put a lot of pieces together. Um, as we'll talk about in a little bit, science has some special information security needs in general. And in addition to that, we have the problems of incident response often being spread across multiple organizations with an increased need to coordinate. Our cyber infrastructure is much more diverse than what a lot of other InfoSec organizations have to deal with. 
um, we're not just talking about a few servers and a lot of desktop computing and maybe a mobile device or two. Many, of the, many, if not most, of the scientific organizations we deal with have ICS and SCADA installs. They have lots of sensors. They have control systems that turn telescopes and operate scientific equipment. Um, they have a lot of one-off equipment that doesn't come with best practices guides. They have to adapt around things that were made for very special applications. So the, we're also dealing with a lot of different scale. We have these large autonomous facilities like Ice Cube, Gemini, LIGO, the LSST. Um, they have their own buildings, they have their own networks, they have their own infrastructure. They tend to have a lot more staff in one place, um, though not always. And we also have small to medium embedded projects. Um, these are projects that are doing good science, but they're doing it often from a place where they're resident on someone else's infrastructure. So while they definitely have information security needs of their own, they also have limitations imposed by the fact that they don't completely control the network. We also have this hugely interconnected and collaborative infrastructure. Um, Oftentimes when I talk to my counterparts in the corporate world, they say, well, we just ban IPs outside the US. We don't do that in science. We have a lot of collaboration going around the world and we need to to continue to do what we do well. Um, so we don't get to take those kinds of shortcuts. Despite the fact or compounding the fact that our job is so complex, we need these specialized skills and they're really, really in demand right now in the private sector. Um, they're in demand in government, they're in demand for us here in the science community. Um, and we don't have enough to go around. So trying to figure out what to do with fewer experts to go around is a big part of how Research SOC came around. Um, we can put up a core of experts that a lot of different projects can benefit from and draw on. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about our strategy and how we bring all of this together. We have two goals. We want to improve the cybersecurity posture of scientific cyber infrastructure and raise awareness of security threats facing the scientific community. In other words, we want to help scientific cyber infrastructure better support science. We want to make it more robust and more trustworthy. And a big part of that is raising awareness of the threats we face because in addition to the fact that not all science projects know what they really need, most of these projects are at least partly resident on university or other networks that they have to deal with and they have to work with those CISOs and those IT departments and make sure that they're getting what they need. And the more that those parent organizations are aware of what's going on and what's needed and why, the easier time the science projects are going to have getting what they need. Research SOC puts a lot of different pieces together to make something that's really customized for science. We take the OmniSOC service, um, Three Rocks has a wonderful vulnerability scanning service and Stinger's Honeypots and put it together with tuning, tailoring, and training for science. And together this becomes Research SOC. So instead of just handing science projects, you know, you can get a security operations service center elsewhere but you can't get one that's prepared to also help you integrate honeypots if you've never had them before and that knows what science can and can't do and that is ready to come in and train your people on the things that they may not have heard of before and need to be brought up to speed because science is still catching up in a lot of ways. Dealing with the scale is something that we actually really love because we get to help all of these really cool facilities doing really cool things, but we also get to have some things to offer to the small projects. And a big part of this is making sure that for our big clients, we're going to be bringing in their teams and making sure that their teams are well trained on what we can offer and how they can better help each other. In addition to all of these wonderful moving technical parts, we're putting together a community of practice, which 
will help people keep up on what they need to know about information security and help them coordinate with one another. We'll be running incident response drills, often called security exercises that span multiple locations to help everybody work together in just bringing that up. Um, when I worked volunteer search and rescue for years, my training lead used to tell me, you don't practice until you get it right, you practice until you can't get it wrong. And it's amazing how this kind of just throwing people into simulated incidents really makes everybody better at what they do very easily, especially if you have more moving parts because you have more facilities participating. So OmniSoc is a pretty complicated beast and that's why we are putting all of the training and customer service and wrapping it up in that support and that community of practice um, because we're bringing together the moving parts that science has to deal with. Um, many of you are on campuses that have your own security team, security operations centers you have to know about or deal with or don't want to know about and don't want to deal with. Um, OmniSoc has been doing this for campuses for a long time and bringing the service to science. We're standing up our own data stack so that science's data doesn't get mixed in with the things that belong to the Big Ten schools. Um, we're going to be able to process and create threat intelligence that you can use. Um, we can notify our clients, incident response teams. If something's going down, we can say, here's what you need to deal with and here's what it looks like to us. We can communicate and share information and help you communicate and share information with one another when you want to. Um, proactive threat hunting is a really big thing. Um, we're constantly working to integrate new threat intelligence sources and to figure out what we need to look for across all our clients. So when a problem occurs at one site, we can say, okay, we've seen this before, and that helps us detect on other sites. So when we're doing our analysis, when we're doing our triage, you benefit not just from the experience of one scientific cyber infrastructure project, but from all of them. And with that, I'll hand it off to Jim Marsteller. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, so as Susan highlighted some of the particular challenges that our community faces, we have very open networks, uh, open research requires um, uh, us to be able to work with people from across the country. We have some really significant resources, large uh, networks with uh, incredible bandwidth, some uh, really unique instruments that can all be very attractive to attackers. And especially in our community where we don't have uh, some of the deep pockets, deep pockets that some of our uh, commercial um, um, colleagues have can make it very challenging. And you have this uh, goal to try to get to a totally secure environment, which can be a mythical place because uh, usability is usually uh, at a very low when you get to that point. Security teams are constantly trying to uh, identify and mitigate vulnerabilities within their environment in order to provide a strong security posture. Uh, this is a daily effort uh, that goes on. Uh, we're on the flip side, uh, an attacker only needs to find one vulnerability and exploit it. So it makes it very challenging. So to uh, help with this uh, situation, the Research SOC has uh, the vulnerability identification service that it's going to be offering to the community. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, we're constantly under uh, scanning from malicious actors uh, trying to identify vulnerabilities. We see this from uh, our own campuses to uh, foreign nations. So, uh, you know, it's just it's a constant persistent activity. So we've reached out to Three Rocks, who has been offering this uh, service to their members for quite a few years. So we bring their expertise and experience to, to this service. Uh, and it is based on the Open Vulnerability Assist, uh, Assessment System, which is an open source framework. It uh, has over 50,000 vulnerability tests that it can conduct. And it also gets uh, daily updates. So we constantly have new uh, signatures to be searching for. So the way that this will work is uh, it will scan your network externally and it, it can identify misconfigured software, software that might be vulnerable or vulnerable. And it also can help identify services that you might have running that really are unnecessary 
or even more importantly, devices that you have exposed to the internet that were never intended to be exposed to the internet. Someone goes in, plugs something into a network, it gets a DHCP address, and you've got uh, a vulnerable system on your internal network. So the way that we see the process uh, um, uh, going is a, a project would contact a research SOC. We have an onboarding process that includes a questionnaire to help identify uh, your resources in your environment. And then what will happen is Three Rocks will conduct a discovery scan to uh, get a footprint of your network. And when we have those results, we'll work with you to help identify the assets that you really feel are important for us to be scanning. And once that's done, we can set up a scan to um, uh, kick off every month, every week, every quarter. It's all up to you. Plus, in addition to that, we will have on-demand scanning. So as you uh, find a vulnerability and you patch it, you want to be able to run that scan again to make sure that you've addressed all of the uh, issues that are with that. Okay, and uh, with that, I think I'd like to hand it over to uh, Richard Beaver. Richard. All right, so let's see. Need to advance a slide, I think. Yep, here we go. So, we can talk to you a little bit about our approach to shared threat intelligence. Uh, we, we call it Stinger, uh, law, or interesting acronym for a long name. And this is basically a way for us to help organizations identify attacks against their networks and then feed that back into the overall effort for protecting the, the networks and systems there. So, if you look at it from an attacking methodology uh, perspective. You have an attacker, they decide they're gonna come after you. The last year, a really good example of this was Eternal Blue. This is uh, one of the attacks that led to, uh, sorry, about a year and a half ago, led to WannaCry being uh, pervasive. Um, and all they have to do, as Jim pointed out, is find one path in and once they have that path in, um, exploiting the system and then further exploiting throughout the environment um, is fairly simple for them. So one attacker, one point of access. What if you could identify this ahead of time? And the nice thing about it, you know, there, there's a pretty, once attacks start happening in the internet, you see uh, patterns and you're able to, to deal with those on a uh, much broader basis. So our approach is to make use of network sensors. Uh, as Susan pointed out, these are primarily honeypots. Uh, we also, from our perspective, uh, we, you can incorporate other data into that that analysis, uh, whether it's metadata from the network, system log files, et cetera. Um, and use that information to identify attackers and compromise machines, put blocks into place on your network with your existing security appliances, and then turn around and share that information with other groups um, so that everybody can benefit. This is really a complicated high-level diagram of how this all might work. And if, if we had honeypots in place on the network, we've been able to prove this out both locally at Duke as well as with several other institutions. But at the, from the time of receipt of the information on a honeypot, you know, about, yes, this is an attacker, this is what they're doing, and then sending that back through for processing, uh, that can happen at a very quick rate of time, um, much faster than what you see with, with kind of the commercial vendors. Um, and, and allows us to, to very quickly both identify the attack as well as then, you know, share it or uh, uh, put the blocks in place and share the information out. If you look at what we were able to experience, I think this is, this is what was most impactful to us when we started doing this a few years ago. Um, we run a commercial intrusion prevention system at, the, at our, our network border. Uh, we were blocking a pretty substantial number of attacks and when we put the system into place, we saw a lot of the noise go away and which gave our security analysts time to focus on what we consider to be the really important things hitting our network. So just shifting the amount of data and getting rid of the amount of noise that's attacking your network, we found to be a very useful exercise. 
Uh, and then one other thing that we wanted to share, uh, just as part of this effort, we do have three partner schools that we've been working with initially. And looking at the overlap between the schools, what's pretty significant in this 30 days worth of data is how little uh, how little there is in terms of overlap between the, the different schools. And what this speaks to is the more of the senior sensors that we're able to deploy across the environment, as well as share that data back, the more of an ability we have to protect our institutions collectively. And we see this as really one of the key strengths is, is uh, building up the, the RSOC framework as, as Vaughn and Susan have described. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna hand it off to Ina for uh, her, her portion of the presentation. Oh, sorry, one other thing, just really quick. Uh, in context with the RSOC, uh, thanks Vaughn, the, uh, you know, using the honeypots to deploy or deploying the honeypots to detect malicious traffic, using that information to feed back into the RSOC and the labs that are being protected, and then participating in active threat intelligence sharing. Uh, we feel like these are very three strong goals of the program, and uh, we're excited about moving forward on it. Ina. Thanks, Richard. Um, switching gears a little bit here. Um, all the information uh, that will be collected as part of Research SOC services is of great value to cybersecurity research. Operational security data not only allows to track malicious activities to respond to them uh, in real time, it can also be extremely helpful in identifying trends, for example, in how intruders mount their attacks. Uh, operational data is also needed for testing mitigation techniques and validating threat models and it can be used in developing best practices for security and privacy. Uh, 16 researchers made a statement back in 2009 that it is crucial for research to engage with operators and vendors of relevant technologies to obtain data. Unfortunately, security data collection and exchange for research purposes remains ad hoc, mediated through individual contacts and channels. And there are actually many challenges in sharing operating uh, operational security data. Such data has many sensitivity and privacy concerns, and producers are often reluctant to share actual traffic or malicious activity data. In Research SOC, we developed a strategy to bring research and practice closer together um, and to increase availability of operational data for research. We believe it is one of the core aspects of improving cybersecurity practice. So our strategy has four parts, and it draws on the sociological computer science and data management expertise within our team. First, we intend to study the needs and current practices of cybersecurity researchers. What kind of data do they rely on today? What is their wish list for security data? How do they protect sensitive and restricted data they work with? Uh, we would also like to be better understand barriers to sharing operational data from security professionals. Second, we will work with our initial adopters to identify acceptable means of sharing their operational data. We will identify a curation approach suitable for this type of data, which is important if we want to make data understandable by the research communities. Uh, such an approach or framework uh, will allow us to add metadata, information about data origin and methods uh, of its collection, and persistent identification for uh, longer term storage. This will improve data integrity, quality, and reusability. Third, we'll prototype a secure environment for sharing operational data. And um, we believe in reuse of existing components and not reinventing uh, the wheel. So such an environment will be based on integrating the existing components of secure infrastructure uh, that's already uh, been created at Indiana University. One of them is Data Capsule. It's a secure virtual environment developed by the Heidi Trust Research Center. And another one is Radars, uh, a secure hub developed at IU for storing confidential social science data. Both of them enable remote data analysis within the virtual environment, uh, and, but they prevent unauthorized leakage of sensitive data. Finally, we'll organize workshops to build awareness of operational data and its potential. We plan to organize two workshops, 
One will be geared towards students and the other one uh, will be aimed at researchers. Um, both workshops will also be an opportunity to test drive data collected by Research SOC. Here you can see a timeline of our studies and engagement activities. We'll begin pilot interviews this spring actually and talk to a small number of researchers. This will allow us to test our interviewing instrument and identify a larger pool of researchers via snowball sampling technique. So if you know researchers who might be willing to talk to us, we'll really appreciate your sending us their information. And then next fall, we will conduct a larger number of surveys and interviews and develop a fuller picture of researcher needs and practices. Uh, during this time, Research SOC will also engage with its early adopters and start generating data. We will use that data as well as other data we identify through our partners in our workshops in 2020 and 2021. All of this, uh, our studies, our engagement activities, data curation and infrastructure prototyping will generate insights into how to support and enable research and improve cybersecurity practices through that. And now I'm uh, passing it to Michael Korn from University of California, San Diego. Uh, thank you very much, Ina. Um, uh, that was going to be very interesting work. Let's get to the right slide here. There we go. Um, so far today, you've heard an awful lot about uh, some really interesting technologies and processes. Uh, but I wanted to start off with a short story for you. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, invited by a researcher to come help them secure their project. I believe they were dealing with uh, medical data. And I brought one of my most senior security engineers with me who was very excited about the opportunity to work with the researcher. And um, so I turned that meeting over to him and he opened it up with, uh, it turned out he had prepared a printout of our minimum network security standards. I'm sure you all have something like this. And he handed it to the researcher and said, you have to do all this. And as you can imagine, the researcher looked back at me and said, um, uh, this is not any help. I can go read policy on my own. So my portion of this grant, what we're doing at UCSD really focuses on how do we prepare the people working in information security um, to uh, take on this challenge. So if you look at your traditional classical enterprise security office, what do we do? We're all a bunch of people that have been trained through a CISSP type of process, which says go off and inventory your environment, write your policies, figure out the controls you're going to apply, you're going to impose, and start monitoring them. The problem is, is that for most of these research projects, they are really custom built cars. They're not enterprise security in the classic sense. To be a successful, uh, to be successful in supporting research projects, you really need to understand how the science workflow works. You need to understand issues like reproducibility. Um, this is an important one. Telling people to up update and patch their systems when they need to run the same experiment multiple times over a period of years could cause serious problems if they need the exact same data to come out. We all also are aware that there is a culture in higher ed that's unique to the research endeavor. And that culture is one of incredible autonomy by the faculty and often a sort of opt into policy uh, mentality. And finally, uh, many of us in in enterprise security are very good at sitting in the back office and working with technology, but to be successful in this world, we're really going to have to talk, get out there and talk to the faculty um, and, and convince them that we understand their problems. So what we decided to do after talking amongst ourselves quite a bit and talking to a lot of um, uh, CISOs in the community is put together a series of workshops. These are, uh, we'll start uh, with four, we'll be having four day workshops here in San Diego once a year. We're gonna have a series of workshops beginning with the May 11th EDUCAUSE SPC conference. Uh, we call them conference aligned workshops, which are micro versions of these same workshops. Um, but the goal here is to bring security researchers, or excuse me, security architects, CISOs, and the security professionals that directly support researchers together and uh, provide the kind of facilitation skills that will allow them to succeed um, 
supporting research projects. So over on the right side of this slide there, I have a sample at a very high level of the kind of curriculum we're talking about. We'll provide on the first day a discussion of how research projects work, uh, what the grant writing process is like, um, what it's like to interact with your Office of Research Affairs, and we'll provide some facilitation training. Uh, there is a large community of, well, I shouldn't say large, a growing community of research facilitators across the country that are IT specialists that work with faculty on helping them build and support their projects. We'll borrow many of the same facilitation skills they do, and in fact, we'll try to engage some of them to help provide some of the training. During the second or the middle two days of the workshop, what we'll be doing is bringing in PIs and researchers um, and having tabletop plan developments with them. So we'll basically be sitting down as a group, working with faculty, uh, trying to tease out of them the information we need to help them secure their projects. And then on the last day, we'll review what we've done, develop artifacts, and figure out how we can support each other on this effort going forward. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Susan. So I mentioned earlier when I was speaking that we're going to have this community of practice and a big part of that is going to be threat intelligence, vulnerability sharing that comes out of RENISAC. Um, RENISAC has a participant participation model that is going to be integrated with research SOC to onboard clients at science projects whether they are independent institutions or embedded at a campus we've got three initial clients and i'm going to talk a little bit about our timeline um, and what we're going to see is, I'm going to talk a bit about the project timeline as a whole and how this works for community of practice because I want the community of practice to grow and be useful beyond just those who jump into the deep end with the full um, research SOC offering. So the project began just before the start of 2019 and we're spending most of this year developing tech contracts, doing outreach, um, and just really preparing to get things rolling. Next year, we're looking at onboarding NRAO, Gemini, and Gage as our demo clients to work the kinks out of our offerings and make sure that we're, we're really giving this trial by fire. This is our proof of, getting it beyond a proof of concept and out into the wild. And after that, it becomes a sustainability model and for fee services. In parallel to this, um, as we're starting to bring in our clients to the wider research SOC project, we're also going to be um, looking at options for helping the wider community with things like threat intelligence, um, community of practice for those projects that maybe aren't ready for the full menu of monitoring and threat intelligence and everything else, at least to start getting their people into a community where they can get more contact with the community, more awareness, and more abreast of what they might need. Um, so we're going to be working on both of those in parallel and working to find out what kinds of things the community really wants from us. Um, there's more information available. You can email rsoc at iu.edu. You can visit us at researchsoc.iu.edu um, or contact any of the people here giving this talk. Um, we've really done a lot of work to make sure that we're addressing the needs of science and not just throwing up another generic sock at you. And with that, I think I'm ready to hand it back to Jeanette. Great. Um, could you, uh, Vaughn, could you please advance? Thank you. Uh, please uh, let us know what you thought of this presentation. And uh, if you have any uh, questions about presenting or topics that you'd like to hear about, I'm going to throw a link to our survey here in the chat. Uh, please take advantage of telling us what you thought and what you'd like to hear uh, more of if you're, if you're a follower of these presentations. Um, and then, uh, Vaughn, could you uh, advance again? Thank you. Uh, about the Trusted CI webinar series, uh, to view presentations, join the Discuss mailing list, uh, or submit requests to present, uh, please visit us at, at trustedci.org webinars. Our next webinar is 
going to be February 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is anticipatory cyber defense via predictive analytics, uh, machine learning, and simulation. And our presenter is Jay Yang. Now, um, that presentation actually uh, is part of the technology transfer to, uh, to practice uh, initiative that uh, Trusted CI is kind of kicking off this year. And we're gonna have a lot more to, to talk about re with regards to TTP next month. So if you're interested in that topic, please join the webinar. And I, uh, we have time for questions. We've got, we've got plenty of time. So if anyone has any questions for the presenters, uh, please take an opportunity to let us know. Uh, uh, you can type it in the chat. And I apologize, I jumped ahead with my spiel before I told you guys that we're taking questions. So uh, Vaughn, did you have any more comments that you wanted to make uh, while people are thinking and typing? No, uh, just uh, thank everybody for joining us here for kicking off the Trusted CI webinars uh, for 2019. And I'll also encourage you, you know, as members of the community, if you have suggestions for the, the research SOC particular aspects you would like to, to see it tackle in terms of your science projects to also please let us know. You know, this is uh, the, the application of these operational security service to science project is, is by no means a, a clear cut issue in how it's supposed to be, to be done. And so we welcome community input on that. I mean, we're gonna be working through it, but to be as broadly applicable as possible, we like to, to hear as many different perspectives as we can. Great, thank you. Um, so a last call for questions, comments. We do have uh, someone saying that it was very interesting and informative. So thanks guys for presenting that. Okay, we got a couple more questions in here. Uh, is there a cost to attend the workshop that was mentioned during the presentation? Uh, no, there is not a cost, but, with, but the applications to uh, attend are going to be reviewed uh, to, to see if you're a good fit for the, the goals of the, of the uh, workshop. Uh, and that will be announced uh, later uh, from, uh, by Trusted CI on our announcements mailing list and other channels. Um, okay, we have another question here. On the slide where present, the presenter was showing the union of four institutes and the overlap, what did the actual numbers represent? So Richard, I think uh, that's a question you're best posed to, to answer. So those numbers, uh, yeah, Douglas, those numbers were um, related to the number of hits, unique hits in, on a 30 day period to the Stinger honeypot nodes that were out at the campuses. Okay, sorry about that. I was still on mute. Thanks, thanks Richard. Um, sure. We've got a couple more questions here. Uh, will the cybersecurity research engagement efforts also take into account previous efforts in providing valuable data to network and cybersecurity researchers? For example, there was a long running. I think, that's, <laughs> I think that's supposed to be a DHS, S and T. Okay. Uh, program that is likely relevant. Yeah, I'll, I'll field this. So there certainly are other sharing efforts out there. So DHS, the one I'm familiar with, is something called uh, Predict that Aaron Canelli now runs. Uh, CADA also shares um, network um, data. And I would say we're, we're certainly uh, looking to learn from those efforts. Uh, I think there's been uh, the real challenge here in trying to get data that can actually be reasonably accessed without too much administrative burden, uh, balancing that with respecting the, the, the confidentiality and privacy of, of the clients in there. And I'm not saying that's an, it's an easy challenge, but I think we know the pendulum uh, needs to be in a place uh, that's balanced between those two things so that the, the data can actually get into the hands of researchers and do some good uh, for practice. So the goal here, and this obviously will, will have to be a, a 
a collaborative discussion between us and the clients is to try to find uh, a process since we recognize, you know, in some sense, we're all talking about uh, an NSF community here of science projects and cybersecurity researchers. We're hoping within that scope, uh, a collaborative nature can emerge since hopefully uh, everyone will see the value of this sharing and we can get to a, a process of allowing that access uh, in a reasonable manner. Okay, I, I'm gonna continue uh, and that person can comment if they have uh, further questions. I accidentally uh, mixed up a couple of different workshops that are, that are going on. And so I just wanna uh, give Mike a chance to respond to that question about a workshop uh, in the presentation. Hi. Uh, no, the, uh, there's no intent to charge for the workshops. Obviously, individuals will have to pay uh, their own travel and room, uh, but the workshops will be at no charge that we're hosting here at San Diego um, or aligned with conferences. Great. Thank you for addressing that, Michael. Uh, we've got another question coming in. How is the Honeypot Project going that was mentioned? Is there examples of multiple universities doing this already? Who were they? Any details to share? Any results of how helpful it's been in discovering intrusions, uh, the idea of sharing info uh, from one side from one site to a community, et cetera. Uh, I yeah. think Jim Marsteller, or, or sorry, was that uh, Richard who who can answer that? Sure. So that is, I would say the project's been going pretty well. We've been working on this for about a year and a half, and we we have a number of schools that are. You know, in, in the uh, proof of concept phase of it, um, I'm not going to name names on here without their permission. Uh, I will note that in the case of one school that put them on their network, they were able to identify within the first 24 hours um, internally compromised systems uh, based off of those systems. Richard, can you hear us? Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Did you get any of that or do I need to start over? Uh, we got a portion of it. Okay. Uh, why don't you start so, over real quick? <laughs> yeah, so so the honeypot effort's going pretty well. Um, I, I can't really name the schools that are involved right now without their permission. Uh, we did have one institution that when they put the honeypots on their network, uh, they were able to identify internally compromised hosts within the first 24 hours. Uh, I think they found two two systems that way. What has been valuable so far are kind of two, two facets of it. The first is you see what is scanning your network pretty actively from the outside. And then based off of your network security defenses, you're able to loop that information back in to do either active blocking or just plug it into, you know, your, your IPS um, policies. And that part has worked very well with the with the schools that we're trialing it with. Uh, in terms of the sharing, our intent is is absolutely to share that information. Uh, Ren Isaac was mentioned earlier in the conversation. We are actively sharing our our data through Ren Isaac today on what is hitting our network, um, so that that can be benefited from the rest of higher ed. And you know, Vaughn kind of touched on this. We really think that's one of the powerful pieces of this, this particular effort is the sharing of that information. When one school gets hit or one lab gets hit, it's nice to have that information shared back with the rest of the community to help identify, you know, potential for, for uh, uh, potential protections. The other piece that's really important that Ina touched on and that was asked earlier is from a research perspective, this is an area that the security community, I believe, can do more in terms of, of building a, a view of data about what is attacking our organizations so that it can be looked at and we can start discerning patterns. You know, do attackers move east to west geographically? Do they attack uh, one particular type of institution over another? And these are all questions that we have all struggled to answer individually, but collectively we're hoping that this leads to some, some uh, improvements in that area. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got another question coming in here. 
how is the information currently being shared? Uh, reports, JSON, XML, et cetera. Uh, so this is related to the Stinger data. The, the, um, we're doing it via JSON. We're also doing it via uh, the collective intelligence uh, framework. So that is CIF. Uh, that is, that's another way in which the information is shared. And then Jim, I'm not sure about the, um, uh, about the vulnerability identification. So uh, right now the way it's set up is the, the client can log into the service directly and uh, view the report. As far as the exporting formats, I, I can't, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I do believe you can export it out to different formats. XML, uh, I know for sure. Okay. Looks like that addresses the question. So uh, why don't we have another call for last minute questions? We still have a few minutes left uh, if people want to ask the team anything. Well, I, I just wanna say that I, I really appreciate everyone giving this presentation and uh, meeting with us and I appreciate your patience. Uh, doing a group presentation is a challenge and you guys handle it very well. So I wanna thank you for, for that. And I think, I think we're pretty much ready to wrap it up because people are saying thank you or thank you. So uh, with that, I will stop the recording.